that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all. It is well, it is well So let go my soul and trust in Him The waves and twin still know His name So let go my soul and trust in Him The waves and twin Hello everyone, uh, it's great to see you guys again and uh, great to have the opportunity to worship again with uh, everyone. Uh, we're going to start a new series in the Book of Psalm uh, starting today and um, we will uh, do our first one uh, today. I hope everybody's doing well and I hope everybody's uh, um, healthy and strong and um, I hope uh, you know you're uh, you're filled with joy and things are going well for you and your family. Um, today we're going to look at um, Psalm uh, uh, thirty-three, um, and um, this Psalm actually um, is when you look at the internal, uh, you know parts of the psalm like when, when you see what the psalm is actually about internally 
it's showing us that who, the, the believers of that time, the community of faith of that time that was singing this psalm, they were actually going through a time of crisis. Um, and uh, that's what this psalm is trying to show us, that the, the believers that were singing at that time, they were actually going through a crisis. But what it's also trying to teach us is that in times of crisis, um, believers, uh, the community of faith is encouraged to worship. It's encouraged to praise. We're going to talk about worship today, uh, but primarily uh, worship in, in, in the sense of music, praise, singing, uh, the, the worship team. Uh, and we're going to see uh, the importance of worship, uh, primarily the singing aspect. Um, last, a few weeks ago, um, I preached on the topic of uh, the importance of prayer in times of uh, great crisis and today we're going to see uh, why we need to worship, why worship is so important for us as believers uh, in times of crisis. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, please open with me to the book of Psalm chapter 33. Again, that's Psalm chapter 33. And this is what Psalm chapter 33 says. Shout to the Lord, shout for joy in the Lord, all you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers wa the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings a counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits in throne, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, and those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our, he is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Uh, this psalm is uh, connected to the psalm before this one, uh, Psalm 32. So chap Psalm chapter 33 and 32 are connected. They're related to one another. And uh, we're gonna see why in a few minutes. Uh, there's many reasons why, but we're gonna see one of the reasons why. Um, psalm 32, uh, this Psalm 33 starts uh, with shouting. You know, it starts with joy, rejoicing, shouting, singing to the Lord. Not only with loud songs, but shouting, you know, uh, screaming with joy. It's with new melodies. It's a new song that uh, the psalmist is uh, asking the the congregation to sing. There, he's basically telling the community of faith to sing a new song. In a time of crisis, he's saying, make a new song to the Lord. Create something new, something fresh. Um, sing loudly, sing with shouts of joy. And, uh, and, and then he says that that's how the righteous and the upright uh, should approach uh, singing uh, and praise in times of crisis. This is not, you know, self or I mean fake uh, manufactured kind of uh, joy, but this is actually real joy. This is why the psalmist is talking about, you know, is telling the righteous to shout in this way, to rejoice in this way, to sing this way, the upright. 
because this is only something that those who are righteous, those who are upright, in other words, those who are right with God, those who are living in ways that are pleasing to God, uh, can, can do. Only those who are at the moment in a, in a, in a, in a way, living in a way that is pleasing to God, uh, those who are healthy internally can make shouting come out of their mouths. If you are not healthy, if you don't have inner health, if you're not doing well internally, if your relationship with God is, is not good, if there's sin involved in your life, there's no way you can sing like this. There's no way you can shout. There's no way you can be jubilant like this. There's no way you can rejoice in singing uh, like this faith community. This is where it kind of connects to chapter 32 because chapter Psalm 32 is all about the psalmist repenting uh, because of his sin and giving thanks to God because of the joy that now came back to him after he repented. In other words, when he was in sin, he says that God's hand was heavy upon him. It was a weight that he was carrying, a burden that he was carrying. He says that his bones were wasting away. But when he confessed it to the Lord and when he repented, joy was restored in his life. Uh, he was able to sing with joy once again a psalm of thanksgiving and, and this is what this is showing us that uh regardless whether we're going through a crisis or not those who can sing are those who are right with god those who can sing are those who are living in ways that are pleasing to god those who can sing are those who are internally healthy they have inner health and that is coming out in the form of melody and, and new songs and shouting and joy uh, to the Lord. Only those who, who are in that state uh, with the Lord um, can rejoice and, and sing in this way. Many times, uh, if we are not interested in, in singing to the Lord, if we don't think worship is important, if we take worship for granted, if, if we don't think that singing is important, even though the scriptures say it is, <laughs> um, that could be a sign that something is not right internally for us. If we, are if we are not able to sing, if we're not able to rejoice, then most likely there's something hindering that. It's, it's a sign, it's showing us that there's something in our hearts that needs to be worked on. Perhaps there's sin involved, perhaps there's something there that's blocking uh, singing and shouting and rejoicing directed to the Lord. Um, and, and that's uh, what we can see from this passage. You know, because of this pandemic and because we have to stay at home, a lot of people, a lot, some people, actually their work, uh, the, the, the demand for their work increased a lot more. So some people are actually busier than before uh, the pandemic happened. But many uh, have more time now than they used to uh, while they're staying at home. They're not as busy anymore. And one of the things that uh, I've heard a lot of pastors say is that they're concerned that this time where, you know, we have to stay at home and we're, when we're less busy, many of us would be tempted uh, to, you know, live in ways that are not pleasing to the Lord. Many of us could be tempted to let our guards down and perhaps engage in, in ways that are not pleasing to the Lord. Uh, so we have to be careful. We have to be careful uh, to, to not do that because that those are the things that take away the desire uh, to want to actually worship God and, and want to sing to Him and, and the ability to be able to uh, stay connected to Him. And as you can see, the psalmist here is actually saying that the, the, the way that the community of faith should praise should worship here he's saying that uh let me read it to you again he's saying uh to to give thanks to make melody uh to sing to him a new song to play skillfully so to make melody to with, with you know the best instruments that you possibly can uh to sing to him a new song something fresh not something that you've been singing your whole life, but, but something new because God does new things in our lives all the time. So honor him with something new because he keeps on doing new things in your life. And then skillfully, like make sure that the praise is actually good. <laughs> and, and I love this part because this is actually a huge uh, passion of mine. Um, I cannot stand bad worship. 
Um, it, it just kills my soul to be engaged in, in bad worship. First, because that's not the worship that fits God. See, even the psalmist here says, play worship, play, do praise that befits him, praise that fits God. Uh, he's definitely worthy of our best worship. Uh, for us to be consumed in creating the best possible worship that we can for Him. For us to play skillfully, to use the best instruments, to make investments so that we can create the best worship possible, to, to sing a new song, uh, to, to, to invite those who are skilled to use their gifts to, 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 to help us praise God in this way, to make melody like this, to make a new song. This is, this is what the scriptures are saying, that worship has to be good. And uh, I couldn't, agree, I couldn't ag agree more that this is how worship needs to be. Because wherever worship is bad, wherever people don't care about worship, when, whenever you can find a church where they just don't care about the worship or an individual that doesn't care about the worship, you can find a church or an individual that's also dying spiritually. Uh, I have been part of uh, different churches in the past and uh, all of the churches I went to were uh, small for the most part. And all of the small churches that I went to, the worship was bad. And not just the preaching, the preaching was bad too, but the music aspect, the, many churches didn't even care. They didn't even have instruments. They, they didn't even have like uh, people to lead. They, they didn't make any investments to try to create a worship that was worthy of God. And also worship that blesses his people. God, good worship is, is for the glory of God, but good worship is also for our own well-being. We need good worship. And we're going to see why more as the psalm continues on uh, for our own faith, for our own spiritual well-being. So, you know, every time I went to a church where worship was bad, that was my first task, my first mission, try to create worship that somehow invites awe and reverence towards God. Worship that is good. Uh, worship that is uh, you know, just as, as good as it can get so that you know, God is glorified and we can be blessed as His people. So it's not right to not be interested in worship. It's not right to not care about worship. It's not right to be, me to be okay with mediocre worship. If that uh, you know, if any of those things applies to you, then there's something wrong with you, perhaps. Something internally is wrong where you are not interested or you have no kind of desire to create a worship that befits God. If that's, if that's you, then that, that actually that's a problem that you have, that you need to bring before God and ask Him to, to help you change. I've seen many, many churches like that. And, you know, at least a few of the churches that I used to be a part of uh, and that didn't really invest in, in the worship of their people. Uh, many of them, they, they no longer have the English ministries that I was serving in. They're gone and they're barely hanging in there uh, and surviving, not knowing when perhaps they might have to shut down. Not only that, but you know, these days, uh, more so the past few years, what I've seen is that there's sort of a division when it comes to worship. You see almost two camps in Christianity when it comes to worship. One camp is, is very conservative, you know, just too conservative, and they only focused on the, the, the preaching of the word. The only thing that matters is the preaching, and rightly so. The preaching has to be good and solid, and it has to be solid food, and it has to be, you know, uh, it has to honor the Lord, and, and the preaching, of course, has to be good. But... The problem is that there's no balance because they only focus on, on the teaching, on the preaching. So although the preaching is good and the teaching is good, what you end up finding at these churches is that the people are dry. The people of these churches are dry. The people of these churches, many times, they're, you know, all of that good teaching sometimes leads them, rather than like to, to true maturity, it leads them to legalism sometimes. And, and you know, one interesting thing that I found is that many, especially young people that come out of these churches, they have a hard time worshiping when they go to other churches. Many of them, they can't even raise their hands in worship or move freely. They can't sing loud. They can't shout because they feel guilty that, you know, uh, in, in 
in doing something like that because that's not how they were trained in, in, in their churches. So that's one uh, spectrum that I see where, you know, the praise doesn't matter, only the message matters. But, but when, when you go to those churches, those churches, you mainly find people that are dry. Good teaching, yes, but they're dry. And, and you find people that have a lot of head knowledge, a lot of theology, a lot of theory, but it hasn't hit their heart. All of that is still only knowledge. It's only theory. It's not real to them because it hasn't hit their heart because they have not been able to let praise, worship, guide what they have in their heads as, as knowledge of God into their hearts and make it real for them. Make it really, let it really change their lives. Unfortunately, it gets stuck in the level of knowledge and theory. And then you go to the other extreme where you find churches that are too much into production and, and sound and, and uh, you know, just fun atmosphere and using the best of the best. And, and, and you know, those churches, you find good music, you find good praise. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it ends up being somewhat too superficial sometimes. And it's more like a Hollywood production rather than a worship service. And uh, sometimes you find that, you know, although it's fun, although the, the quality of the praise is great, the message, the, the, word, the scriptures, is the, 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 the sermons are not uh, solid sometimes, or a little bit shallow, a little bit superficial. And although it's fun and although it's, it's a great atmosphere, uh, oftentimes that's, that's all you get. Uh, there's not, there's not, not, enough, not enough depth. There's a lot of hype, but there's not a lot of depth. So we find like two different extremes of, of praise and worship, you know, at least that's what I've been noticing more the past few years. But here the psalmist is showing us that is, we need both. We need to combine both. Yes, and you're going to see how you know, this unfolds. Yes, the, 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 the worship has to be grounded in, in good theology. And you're going to see that from this point on, everything is theology. Everything is about God. It has, to, it has to be grounded in good theology, but it has to be good. It has to be good. It has to move you. It has to touch you. It has to take, you know, theory, knowledge, theology to the heart, from the head to the heart, so that it, there's a balanced growth, maturity, transformation in your life. Uh, and it can't only be a Hollywood production. There has to be substance. There has to be depth to it. But we need both. Uh, we can't, you know... Uh, just uh, settle for either one. We need to have both when it comes to worship. We need to care enough for worship to be good. That's a sign of inner health. And also it needs to have substance. Uh, and the reason why worship needs to be good, here's why worship needs to be good. Because when you read the rest of the psalm, uh, you can see that as, as this community of faith in this chapter starts to worship, when the worship is actually really good, it's skilled, it's, 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 it has a melody to it, there's the best equipment that, you know, uh, uh, best uh, instruments that they use, and, and there's a new song, and they're shouting and they're rejoicing. When, when the praise, when the worship is good, you know what that leads them to? It leads them to see God in a bigger way. It expands their theology of God. It makes what was only up here, only knowledge, it makes it real. It, it makes it come, come into life. It makes it come to life uh, when the worship is good. This is what any of you who lead worship, this is what any of you who are good with instruments, this is what any of you who God has called to lead worship or to direct worship or to or to put together worship, this is what you can do. You can enhance the spiritual faith uh, of your church congregation, of the members of our church, to be able to see God bigger, to be able to see God for who He is, to enlarge our capacity to see God for who He is, which in turn helps us uh, grow in our faith. Uh, and it helps us uh, turn that into joy and hope and, and singing, as we, we're going to see uh, throughout the psalm. See, like when, when the worship was good, uh, this congregation, th as they were singing this psalm, as, as, they, were, as they were worshiping, uh, uh, as they were worshiping, when the worship was good, they started to see God as their creator. 
right? They, and in the moment of crisis, their worship led them to a deeper knowledge of God, to see God bigger. They started to see God as their creator, right? That's why here it says that the, this is what here it says, for the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Here he's showing us that good praise led the members to remember God, the maker, the creator, that God was able to create the entire universe with only his words. That his words are not empty, but they actually create when spoken. Uh, that, 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 that's power. That's power when, when all you got to do is say a word and an entire universe is created. They were able to see God, the creator, in their lives once again. They were able to, in their worship, they were, they were gaining new strength and, and new joy because they were able to see God for who he was. He's big, he's powerful. He's creator of, of the universe only with words. Now that's truly powerful. I can't even have my daughter, you know, uh, uh, you know, do something as simple as cleaning her toys when, when, when words come out of my mouth uh, directing her to, to do something. My, my words are powerless. I can even have my daughter like clean her toys. But God's word is powerful. That's how he created everything. He didn't even use his finger. You know, that's how powerful he, he didn't even have to use his finger. He only had he only had to say it. He only had to use his word to create the universe, the earth, the world that you and I live in right now. And when God spoke, not only he not only did he bring, you know, the world into the universe into creation, but he also brought his characteristics into the world that he created. Uh, that's why here is the psalmist is talking about God being upright and righteous and faithful and his steadfast love, meaning that when God created the universe, he also created it with his characteristics. So the world that God created, this is why sin cannot thrive in God's created world, because it's going against the fabric of his creation. He didn't create this world to thrive in sin. He created it in, according to his character, justice, righteousness, upright, steadfast love. This is why those who live in ways that are pleasing to God will enjoy this world the most, because we're going to be living in ways that this world was created to be lived by, according to the characteristics of God. Uh, so that's what was created. It was God created the world with his characteristics. When he spoke it into existence, he commanded it and it came to be. And, uh, and my favorite, one of my favorite parts of, of this uh, psalm is, is that, that word steadfast love which actually is repeated three times in this psalm, but it's also part of how God created his world. Do you know what that means? Steadfast love means that his love is always there, constant, never changing. It will never disappear. Meaning this world that we live in, even though as fallen as it is, one of the characteristics of God's world is love, is his steadfast love. That means you and I are always going to be experiencing and enjoying love in this world. As long as we live here on earth, we're going to inevitably be surrounded and, 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 and filled by and experiencing uh, steadfast love in our everyday lives. You know, many of you got, I say many of you because I didn't get it yet. Many of you got that stimulus check that the government sent. You know what that is? That's steadfast love. Many of you, many of us, right now have a place to actually shelter in. We have a house, a home. You know what that is? That's steadfast love. We have food in our tables, we have protection, we have health. You know what that is? That's steadfast love. Like God's love will manifest itself daily in your lives because that's how he created this, this world to be like. So we will always experience steadfast love in our lives in big ways and in small ways now the cool thing about this is that his steadfast love is not only for right now but it's for the future so in other words let's just say for example if you lost your job then 
the, the very definition of steadfast love is that in many ways you should be excited because something else is going to happen. His love is going to man manifest in some other way. Because he loves you, he's not going to let you just drown and die. But somehow, if you lost that job, sooner or later, his love will manifest in different ways. Perhaps in a different job, in a path you didn't know existed, in a different life completely. But somehow, someway, that's coming. That's coming. That's already brewing. It's going to happen. It's, it's, it's how his steadfast love functions and works. Isn't it uh, amazing that you know, we don't have to believe that the world was created by chance, uh, but it was actually created by God, uh, who created it to be a righteous world, who created it with steadfast love, uh, and for us to enjoy and benefit from. Uh, that's what this praise song, this psalm was leading uh, these uh, community, this community of faith to start to see when the praise was good when the worship was actually good it started to open up their hearts to the beauties of God it started to open up their hearts once again uh, to the power of God the, the creator God it started to make God bigger and bigger and all of their problems and fears smaller and smaller the more they started to engage in worship uh, not only is God creator, but then he connects it with, with God being you know, in, in complete control of world affairs, world history, human affairs, international affairs. That's what he means by you know, when he says that you know, he frustrates the plans of those powerful people. Uh, there's, there's powerful people you know, who plan things and who think they're in control. And sometimes these powerful people, they oppose God. But here what it's saying is that ultimately the only counsel that survives, the only counsel that thrives, the only will that gets done is the will of God. It's not the people that try to frustrate the plans of God. It's not the powerful people that thought they were in control and they can make things happen in the world. They are not in control. Here it's saying that even sometimes when they try to plan things that oppose God, this is how powerful God is. God makes it into his will. You know, kind of like, remember when Jesus was being crucified and the religious leaders thought that they were getting ready, they were getting rid of, of their threat? That was actually God's will unfolding in the midst of their evil plans. So it last, the last person, the one who has the last say is God ultimately. He can frustrate the plans of the proud. The, the, the corrupt men don't get to have the last say. God gets to have the last say. He's in complete control. And you know why this is really comforting? Because this means that right now, uh, who, who, who has uh, the will of God for your life and mine, the one who has total control and power over what's going to happen to you and me, is not the government, is not the people that are giving you a hard time, is not corrupt leadership. I'm not saying that we have corrupt leadership, but you know, in other parts of the world as well. It's not this pandemic, but ultimately what will happen in your life is what God wills it to happen. That's what's going to happen in your life. That's what's going to take care. Uh, that's what's going to take place tomorrow. What He wills, not what your enemies are planning against you, not what other people are planning against you, not what the government says, uh, not you know what the pandemic is leading things towards, but what God uh, says and wills. He's in complete control, uh, and His will ultimately gets done all the time. He has the last say in everything. So he's creator, he's in control, and also he sees everything. Here he says that from his throne, from heaven, he looks down and he sees every single human being. He sees every inhabitant in the world, every person that he created. He can see everybody. Not only can he see everybody, but he, here it also says that God sees the hearts of men, the hearts that he fashioned in men so he gets to see everything about your heart and mind he sees every human being and he can see to the core of every person's heart you know we are limited in what we can see we are we are limited in what we can know we we have no power to be able to see what's in somebody else's heart sometimes we're even confused about what's in our hearts but god can see through everybody's heart god can know everything as is happening so 
it's comforting to know that we're under the authority and control of a God who sees everything and knows everything, who is not limited. It's also comforting for those of us. Earlier I said that, you know, if we're in sin, uh, we have to just repent and get out of it. But it's also comforting to know this. That God actually sees your sin. He sees your mess. He can see the core of your heart. He, he, we can't hide anything from Him. He sees everything. But you know what He also does? Even though He can see to the core of our hearts, our deepest sins, even though He can see everything, you know what He also does? He shows steadfast love. Isn't that amazing that He sees everything, the most corrupted and sinful of hearts, yet He still continues to love the mess that He sees? That's so amazing, isn't it? That He can act, that we can really be in sin, but He will never stop loving us. He will always continue to work in us. He's, he's engaged at macro level, creating the universe. He's engaged at micro level, working in your heart and your life, in your sin, and loving you in the midst of, of it all. Not only is God able to create, able to uh, control history, everything gets done according to His will. Uh, and, and, and not only does He know and see everything, but he also is powerful. He is the only one that actually has answers to your problems and mine. That's why here it's saying that God is the only one that has an answer to death and, and life and famine. Like those things that are terminal in our lives. If, if we're about to die, he's the only one that can save us. If we do die, he's the only one that has, has an answer to life after death. Uh, but if we do stay alive, here it says that he's the only one that keeps us alive in famine. He's the only one that can sustain us and keep us going in the midst of a famine, in the midst of a pandemic. He's the only one that actually has the power to do that, regardless of how bad things get. He is powerful. And he compares that power with, with those who trust in, and, and put their hopes in a great army, a great warrior, or a great war horse. You know, all of these things were things that people put their hopes in. But they, they could not save. They were not enough. They will never know, even after having so much power available, so much technology available to them, they couldn't know if they can actually be saved, if they can actually escape, if they can actually win. They, it wasn't guaranteed to them. They, it didn't give them the power to do that. And in the Old Testament, trusting and multiplying the power of, of, of warriors and horses and, 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 and an army, it was a sign of misplaced trust. It was a sign that people were trusting in the wrong things rather than trusting in God, putting their dependence and trust in God, the only one who is truly powerful and the only one who can really save. Um, and, and, and we can see that. And the beautiful thing here is that here it says, you know, when the, when the psalm ends, by the time the psalm ends, the community of faith now, they, they, might have, they might have started in a crisis, they might have started in fear, by, by the, by, but by the end of the psalm, it ends with great hope and great confidence and great comfort. And they say it themselves, it ends with them being in gladness. In other words, good praise leads people to see God big for who He is and what He has done. And the bigger God gets in their lives, the smaller their fears, the smaller their problems become, and their fears turn into hope. Their fears turn into singing. Their fears turn into melody. Their crisis turns into expectant hope and gladness. Here they say, we're waiting, we're waiting for the Lord with expectation, with hope, like a little child would wait for the next day to open up their Christmas gift. They know that something great is about to come. They know it's, it's going to come for sure. And that's the kind of expectation good praise led once they got to see God for who He is uh, and, and when they understood of what, what are the things that He can do. Because this psalm ends by saying that God frustrates the plans of the proud, those who oppose Him. But those who humbly come before Him, those who fear Him, those who come to him in awe and reverence, to them, here God promises deliverance. He promises help. He promises to, to offer help and deliverance to them. 
And, and that's why they can expect, wait with expectancy and hope. Because to, to those who depend on God, to those who put their trust in Him, not, not in a great army or horses or you know, warriors, they will experience true deliverance. So not, not only do they have hope and gladness, but they have guarantee that God is going to come through for them and deliver them from their troubles. Uh, to me personally, uh, it's a little bit hard to, you know, as I'm kind of like seeing all of this unfold, to me personally, um, it's, um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, one, one thing that's interesting is that, you know, we, we, we live in a world, uh, uh, the country that we live in, uh, we, we, we claim to be the most powerful nation, the wealthiest nation still in the whole world. Uh, we're the most powerful, we're the wealthiest, and we have a strong government, and we have experts from all fields trying to battle this virus. So we are as strong and as powerful as it gets on earth. But it is so interesting to me that the most powerful nation and the most wealthy nation, the only thing that we can do when it comes to fighting a virus is to stay home. It was just so interesting to me uh, to, 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 to reflect on the fact that we are the most powerful, but the best that we can do when fighting a virus is to simply stay home. That doesn't seem too powerful to me. <laughs> that doesn't seem, uh, you know, like, like we're in control of anything. Um, you know, I've heard that many people lost, lost a third of their retirement when this pandemic happened. They saved their whole lives and they lost a third of it in weeks. Many have lost a lot in the stock market and their investments. Uh, many have lost their jobs. All of these things that we put our hopes and trust in have failed us. Uh, they have not been enough. The most powerful country has not been enough. The most ex experts have not been enough. Uh, the retirement, the investments, the stock, nothing that we put our hope and trust in has been enough. And that's exactly what this psalm is trying to teach us. It's trying to teach us that we are not enough. That nothing on this earth is enough. The great warriors, the great army, a war horse, nothing is enough. The only one who is enough is God. This psalm is trying to teach us, it's trying to bring us back to set our hopes on something stable, on, on a rock, rather than only in probabilities and weaknesses, in something that actually can deliver someone who is actually powerful and in control someone who will have the last say and the last will somebody who knows everything and sees everything somebody that can deliver from death and life somebody that will provide for all of our needs it's trying to bring christians back to trust and depend on god because we have been trusting in so many other things and that's why we're so worried and that's why we're so anxious and that's why we're so fearful that's what the psalm is trying to do. This is why praise has to be good. Because when praise and worship is good, it leads us to see God bigger and bigger and bigger. And it makes everything, all of our problems and worries and fears, smaller and smaller and smaller. It helps our hearts trust and depend in God once again. It brings us back to the right place of trust and dependence. And once we start to do that, once we can see God bigger and bigger and bigger and our problems get smaller and smaller and, fall and smaller, you too will have new melodies in your heart. You too will be able to sing a new song. You too will be able to finally open your mouth, find healing in your soul to open your mouth, to sing praises to God for who He is and what He has done you too will be glad when you start to see God for who He is and what He has done. Your hope will start to rise as well. Let me pray. Father, we thank You for this time. We thank You for Your Word today. Lord, teach us how to trust in You, to depend on You. Forgive us, Lord, for having given our hearts, our affections, our loves, uh, to so many other things and people that cannot deliver 
nor really have power or help. Forgive us for spiritual adultery, Lord, where instead of loving you, we have loved other things uh, and trusted in other things so much more. Let us not waste this pandemic. But may this pandemic, Lord, lead us back to you. May it lead us to see your beauty. May it lead us to see your power. May it lead us to trust, depend, and love you more than anything once again. May it lead us to gladness. May it lead us to hope. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Is a word. 